Ready to build something async? Los geht's! Hi there, welcome back to the Dev All. I am Roman and this is our second episode in the small async series. In this episode, we are actually going to build something and we try to make good use of the stuff we have learned in the last episode. So watch this video till the end and I hope you get something out of it. If you want to give me a subscribe, I would be very happy about it. It would help me a lot. So without further ado, los geht's. All right, as I said, in this episode, we are going to build something useful, but we will do this in a fake way. So we are not really actually hitting a real database or a real API. We're doing this, we're faking this by using those async blocks. But in order to be able to show you that when we are using those async blocks, we are actually able to hand over the control to another thread and await the async to complete, I will show you just a very small example here that this is actually really working. So in this example here, we have a function called owl that takes the unit parameter and it has an async block in it. And within this async block, we are actually waiting. So we use the system threading thread sleep function or method. So we are waiting for two seconds here. And then we are returning a string. So what this whole function is returning is an async of string. Because we use the return keyword here, we are wrapping this string in an async. So when we run this in the REPL down here, we see that it's a function that takes the unit and returns an async of string. And now we'll build another value that is also using an async computation expression here, but without the parameter. So it's just a value that returns an or that is an async of unit. And in this computation expression here, in this async block here, we print out something. In this case, it's def. And then we are awaiting the other async block up here, the all one, to complete. So we say let bang with the all function that we are calling. And we await this to complete. So the all returns an async of string, but after the let bang, it's just a string because we are waiting this. And then in the end, we are printing out the value that was returned by calling this asynchronous function. And then we're just printing this out. And because we're not using return here, the whole value is just an async of unit. And now we are just actually calling this. So we don't use the async run synchronously function here. We are using the async start function. And the difference in here is that we are returning units. So we're not doing anything with the return value of this asynchronous expression. So we are putting this our def all value into the async start. And then we wait for another second. And then we print out common. So and when we run all this, we actually see that the first thing that is printed out is def coming from the step old value here. And then we are calling the async one. And because it's waiting for two seconds, it takes two seconds to complete. And because this system threading thread sleep down here just waits for one second, this is much faster. So we see that the first one is print out is def. Then we have the Romsen because the asynchronous block was handing over the control to the actual main thread and it prints this out so it it completes this thread and then when the two seconds so when the other async is actually arriving or is completing we can actually then print out the owl so now that you have seen that this is actually working let's build something that might make some more sense to you so what we are going to do here so we are not going to implement a async, real asynchronous operations. So we are not going to do API requests or web requests or file access or database access in here. We are just simulating this because I, I want to keep this simple. But I think with this following example, we can actually understand how all this fits together. So what we have in here is we have users and these users can write posts in some kind of systems. Just think of something like Medium or some blog post site, actually. 
So, and it's it's a pretty simple domain model here. So we just have the user, which is a single case discriminated union with the user of the system GUID. And we have a record, which is a post. And this post just have some, has some content, which is a string. And we just recorded somehow the number of views. And our goal is now to ask our database or to ask our API to get the top three contents of one user. So our goal is to first get the user based on a specific username. And then we try to get all the, the contents, all the posts that the, the user was writing. And then we try to get the top three of them and return just the contents of those posts. And this is what we're going to do in here. So to have this pretty simple in a normal synchronous F-sharp thing. We have two functions. The first one is the user query function. So this function just takes the username and returns an option of a user. So if we find the user, then we return some and the user. And if we don't find it, we return none. And in here, we could have any kind of fancy query logic. We could ask a database or your files or whatever, whatever. What we are doing here just to, to simulate this is we say, okay, we just create a new UUID for this user. We wrap this in the user with the user constructor and then wrap this with the sum constructor. So what we get back is the user option. So in a normal system, you would replace this with your somehow fancy query logic. And then we have a function that returns all the posts of the user. So what we get is a user option as the input parameter. And what we return in here is the list of all the posts of the user. So we match over this. We don't use option map here. We don't use all this fancy stuff just to keep it simple in here, okay? So we just match over this. And if we actually have a user, we would have another fancy query in here that somehow asks an API or asks the database or whatever to find all the posts from a user in, in our system. And in this case, it's just hard coded those five records in here. So, so we just get a list of five records when we ask for some user. And if we don't have a user, we just return an empty list. This is pretty simple. Then we have two functions. The first one is the top three of those posts. So it takes a list of posts, sorts them by the number of views, and just take the first three. It sorts descending to get the top post on the top. And then we have the contents function, which just takes a list of posts and maps over them and just returns the content of those posts. So we get a post list and we return a list of strings. And then we can use pretty nice and idiomatic F sharp code. We can just pipeline all this stuff and we ask for the user with the username dev all. We pipe this into the posts of this user. We pipe this result into the top three posts and then we pipe this into the contents. So we have a list of at most top three contents of the user dev all or of a given user. So when we run all this, we see our functions, user, post of user, top three, content, top three and contents. And we see that our result is a list of three uh, strings. And okay, this is not very smart because they all have the same content. So we don't really see this. So we just number them with one, two, three, four, five. And when we run this again, we see that the fourth post is the, the best content, so the most viewed content, and then the fifth, and then the, the first one. So if we have a look at our list, we see that the first one had 100 views, the fifth one 42, and the first one 10. So this works pretty nicely. Now we actually want to be able to make all this async, because if we are asking a database, this is some IO operation, this might take some time, if we actually ask some API, if we, we split up our system into some kind of smaller services, some microservices or some cloud error functions, all this stuff, all this stuff takes time. These are IO operations that go over the network, that ask a database, that go to the file system. 
and we don't want to block our whole system when we are actually just querying something. We don't want to wait all the time. We don't want the user to wait. We don't want the user interface to stop just we're doing some operations that can be done asynchronously. So our goal is to convert this stuff to an asynchronous pipeline. So the first thing we are doing is to take our user query function and make this async. We just want to query this user in an asynchronous way. So we change or we, we create a new function that we call user async to show that it's an async function. And we are not returning a user option anymore. What we are returning now is an async of user option. So again, it's a description of a asynchronous operation that we need to start manually at some later place in our system. And still, we don't actually ask some API that is returning some async by itself. We just wrap this stuff in our own async computation expression. This is pretty nicely done and pretty easily done uh, in here. So we just wrap this and then we use the return keyword that I was just talking about. And because we don't really use return bang, we use the normal return keyword. Our user option is just wrapped in an asynchronous operation. So then we change our user function to user async. But now we have a problem because our post of user function expects a user option and not an async of a user option. So what can we do with this? How can we actually work with this now? Uh, the easiest possibility to do is to use again the async.run synchronously function. So when we use this function, we see that everything compiles. And when we run this, we see two things. The first one is we get the same results, which is nice. And the second one is that we have this new user async function that takes a string and returns an async of user option. And when we have a look at the run synchronously function in here, how does this work? Well, we have a computation in here, which is an async of type T. And then we could, if we wanted to also put a timeout and a cancellation token in here, we are not talking about this now. So we just put the computation into this function as its parameter. And the return value of the function down here, um, you see that it's the same type as the T of the asynchronous operation. So if we put the, in there an async of user option, the run synchronously function takes all this takes all this async stuff, runs it synchronously, and then returns the result. And then we can use this in our pipeline. Okay, this was pretty easy. Now we have also the post of a user in some other place of our system, or we want to actually query this in an asynchronous way. So what we're doing is the same thing as with the user function. We have a new function called posts of user async, and we don't return a post list anymore. We return an async of post list. So we just wrap all this stuff in our async block, pretty similar to the other one. And then uh, we just return a list of posts in here. And again, we are using the return keyword. So this is wrapped in a normal async operation. But now we have the same problem again. The top three function doesn't expect an async of post list, but it expects a post list. So what we can do again here naively is to say, okay, we again use the async.run synchronously function. And then everything compiles because we get an async of post list into the run synchronously function. And so it spits out a post list because it had run the async operation. And when we run all this again, we see that we still get the same result and we have a new function post of user async, which takes a user option and returns an async of post lists. Nice. But now we see here, we have used twice the async run synchronously function. And when we use this function, it defeats pretty much the purpose of having all this async stuff in our system because we have an async that could potentially hand off the execution to some other thread while waiting for an IO operation to return to arrive. 
but we don't make use of this because we take this whole thing and run it synchronously. So this thread has to actually wait at some point. And then we feed this result into the post of user async function. So we have a new async possibility, but we don't make use of it again. And this is not very smart. And in general, this async run synchronously function should only be called once in your system. So what you want to do is have a pipeline of all kinds of asynchronous operations, but don't say run synchronously at different places in your system. So what you actually want is to just describe all the asynchronous operations in your system and then only call it once. So how are we going to do this? So the first thing we do is we just have those two asynchronous operations and we don't want to run async.run synchronously twice. So we just want to run it once after the post of user async functions because afterwards we just have two synchronous functions and this should be a right to have this run synchronously run earlier. But when we get rid of the first async done run synchronously function, we have a problem now again, because the post of user async function expects a user option and not an async of user option. So what can we do about this? Well, we could just write another function that actually takes an async of user option, awaits the result, and then puts this result into the post of user async function. So this is what we're actually doing. We have a new function and this takes an async of user option. Then we have a new async computation expression and then here we use the lab bang keyword. So what are we actually doing is we take the user which is an async and then we await the result of this asynchronous operation and then we would call the post of user async function. But now you see here that we use a return bank keyword. Why is this? Well, we are going to feed the user option into our post of user async function. And when we have a look at this function, we see that this function already returns an async of post list. And if we have used the return keyword without the bang, as we did in the post of user async function here, we would actually wrap this async again so we get an async of async of post list. And this is definitely not what we want. So we tell F sharp, okay, the post of user async function is already returning an async. So this is nice. So don't do anything anymore and don't wrap it, just return it. So when we run all this, we see that we still get the same result and that the type of the post of async user async is that it takes a parameter as an input, which is an async of user option, and it returns an async of post list. But now still we have a problem. What we have done is we haven't put the run synchronously function at the edge of our program. We just put it somewhere within our pipeline. What would happen if we needed to implement another asynchronous function after the top three because we had the top three and then you need to do another async call. What should we do then? Of course, we needed to put another async run synchronously function into this pipeline to be actually able to run all this stuff. And we had the same problem again. We run this async run synchronously functions whenever we are actually working with those async blocks. And this is not what we want. We want to have this stuff in the end. So how can we actually do this? Yeah, that's a pretty good question. How can we actually do this? Big cliffhanger. Ooh. But we are going to do this in the next episode. So see you soon. Bye bye.